Renaissance men and women are few and far between these days, but my guest Benjamin Radford is about as close as they come. As a writer, investigator, and skeptic, Radford has shed some much needed rational light on all sorts of paranormal phenomena, including psychics, ghosts, exorcisms, so-called miracles, stigmata, lake monsters, UFO sightings, crop circles, and Bigfoot. Wait, Bigfoot isn't real? Well, when he's not dashing my dreams of one day meeting a Sasquatch, he's podcasting, creating board games, contributing to Snopes.com, and speaking at universities and conferences. See? I wasn't lying about the whole Renaissance man thing. Here's Bigfoot dream crusher, Benjamin Radford. Benjamin Radford, welcome to the Stephen Kingdom. Thanks for talking with me today. Well, I wanted to start with uh, how you got interested in your field. Like most teenagers, I was always interested in the unexplained and the mysterious, right? Bigfoot, uh, psychic powers, crop circles, Loch Ness Monster, Bermuda Triangle, whatever. But gradually, as I looked more closely at it, I realized that there was very little actual investigation. Most of what I was reading was sort of just so stories or, you know, it is said that or, you know, some say that or whatever else. I'm like, hold on here. These are fascinating topics, psychics and ghosts and crop circles and weird things. And because of that, I want to know what's the truth behind them. I love ghost stories. I love scary movies. I love all those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, my question is, okay, that's all cool, but is it real? Well, it sounds like you're a man of conflict because on one hand, you'd love nothing more than to prove the existence of all this paranormal phenomena, but you find yourself always disproving it. Do you find yourself constantly at war with yourself? Uh, yeah, I mean, as a skeptical investigator, I would love to actually prove these things are true. It'd be awesome. I would love to find Bigfoot. I would love to prove that ghosts exist. I would love to prove that psychics can predict the future. That would be awesome and fascinating. I'd love to be on the cutting edge of it. The problem is that so far in my research and my investigations, it just isn't so. The quality of the evidence for most of these things, whether it's psychics or Bigfoot or whatever else, is very low. It's blurry photographs. It is, you know, secondhand stories. It's anecdotes. And that's all well and good, but from a scientific point of view, we need hard evidence. We need something more than that. So your investigations cover a wide swath of topics, everything from ghosts and exorcisms, psychics, cryptozoological phenomena like Bigfoot and lake monsters. Chupacabras. And chupacabras, right. <laughs> and UFOs and mm -hmm. extraterrestrials and all sorts of things. What's your process when you start to investigate something that's out of the ordinary? The basic investigation process is the same whether you're investigating a homicide, uh, a case of fraud, or a ghost. You're looking at trying to gather evidence. You're looking at talking to eyewitnesses. And the real difference is that you're trying to bring critical thinking to the process. And a lot of times people will say something like, oh, well, the paranormal is sort of beyond science. I don't even know what that means. There's nothing that's beyond science. Science is all around us. In the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm gonna have to science the shit out of this. The way that I approach these mysteries is, is through investigative skepticism. And so that's just basically saying, show me the evidence for it. I don't go into these topics trying to debunk or disprove because why would I bother? I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And if the answer is that these people have psychic abilities, or the answer is there really is a monster in Loch Ness, or there really is a Bigfoot, great. That's <laughs> I, I want to be there. I want to see it and experience it and poke at it and say hi. There are no big feet. But if the answer is that these things actually aren't real, then the question is still an interesting one because the question becomes, why are people seeing and experiencing things that aren't there? What mundane things are they interpreting as ghosts or as psychic powers or whatever else? The other approach that I bring to it is folklore. So I'm a member of the American Folklore Society and I love bringing folklore to, uh, to these investigations because so often what we read about is infused with folklore, whether people recognize it or not. Urban legends and rumors and stories, it's all around us and they're often not even recognized. 
And so when you when you bring in a folkloric perspective, suddenly things tend to make sense because you see patterns. You see patterns in, in claims, in eyewitness accounts, in stories. You see the same stories sort of recur in ghost stories and legends. And when you understand it through that prism, oftentimes it's more solvable. Yeah, I did want to touch on that. You know, Stephen King goes to great lengths in the novel Carrie to ground this fantastical notion of telekinesis with all sorts of real interstitials like news articles and textbook excerpts. And I'm just wondering what you think of his approach to that. It was really pretty interesting to me. You know, as somebody who who has spent years investigating these weird things, it was fascinating to sort of see this novel that was written in, I think, 1974, how King sort of weaves in his and popular culture assumptions about psychokinesis. You know, it's, it's one of those things where everybody brings their own worldview to entertainment. And you could call it baggage, if you will. I don't necessarily mean that negative way, but we all, we all bring our perspectives to it, right? A book read by a thousand people is a thousand different books. <laughs> and that's certainly the case with Carrie. So when I was reading Carrie, uh, a couple things jumped out at me. One was that he sort of does the old standard, like, it doesn't say based on a true story, but it's pretty damn close, right? <laughs> He's doing this sort of epistolary fiction thing, this sort of meta narrative this putting on of like, well, this is fiction, but you know, he's, he's referring to, you know, Reader's Digest and Science Yearbook and the Dictionary of Psychic Phenomena. And then he sort of, you know, brings in this, this sort of, it's almost like a quasi conspiracy towards the end because he suggests that scientists are aware of psychic abilities, including uh, psychokinesis or telekinesis, but they don't want to talk about it. There's this sort of like, well, you know, they've buried it, right? And this is actually very common. This idea that that uh, that scientists don't want to admit that that extraterrestrials have visited us or psychics are real or realms. If scientists just admitted the truth, then their careers would be destroyed. No, that's not how science works. If 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 scientists knew for a fact that the ghost existed or psychic power existed, they'd win a Nobel Prize if they could prove it. Can't burn the find of the century. That's going to win somebody the Nobel Prize. This is not something that scientists are, are afraid of or skeptics are trying to debunk and disprove and, and make sure that no one knows about it. We want to see the evidence for it. Well, as a skeptic, given the information provided in the novel, would all of this be enough for you to say, all right, case closed, telekinesis is real? Sure. The answer is yes, right? I mean, you could say the same thing about any any sort of supernatural uh, novel or story, right? Had I been in the in the gym in the prom, when everything is going just you know sideways and there's pig blood everywhere and people are getting electrocuted, they'd be like, you know, there's something to this. I I, I got to say, this is um, you know, I think they got me on this. Part of the story here is that there is this big gulf between how Hollywood portrays pretty much everything supernatural paranormal and how ordinary people experience them. In Carrie, we're seeing, you know, undeniably <laughs> amazing, jaw-dropping, scary-ass psychokinesis of you know, epic proportions. In real life, when you talk to people, even people who are, are hardcore psychic believers and psi researchers, they will tell you that, of course, the sorts of effects they're, they're finding are very, very small. As someone who's investigated telekinesis cases before, what do you think of Stephen King's portrayal of TK and Carrie? In the novel, Carrie is experiencing things that are sort of changing and things that are forced upon her and that are scary, right? Menstruation and telekinesis. These are things that come unbidden to her. She's unfamiliar with them. Although, of course, in, in, in the novel, she has a, a, a brief episode when she was much younger. But in both these cases, you have something that is scary and empowering at the same time. And this is a common theme, right? So, for example, you'll often hear about the reluctant psychics. Oftentimes, you, when you talk to psychic mediums or people who claim to have these abilities, they will say flat out, I never wanted this power, it was just given to me. I first sensed it when I was a teenager, but I, I didn't want this and I don't want this. You don't want no part of this shit. I would love this, right? I mean, like, oh no, it's like, you don't understand, it's such a burden to, I'm like, well, 
if it really bothers you that much, then number one, why do you have your psychic hotline set up and why are you charging people, you know, 85 bucks an hour for your readings? But you see this over and over again. Of course, in Carrie's, in Carrie's case, she's, they're not, she's not helping anything else. She's killing people left and right. But in most cases of psychics in, in the real world, there's this sort of altruistic notion about it. There's a sort of like, well, it's a burden, but I'll use my powers. By the way, I take a uh, PayPal or, or check. The bigger context here is that psychic abilities really covers a broad range, right? So there's precognition and knowing the future, there's clairvoyance, there's clear audience where people claim to be able to hear things that occur uh, in far distances. There are, there's a, a version of uh, what was called remote viewing uh, where people claim to see, like literally see or imagine their minds, something that's going on across the country, around the world, things like that. But psychokinesis is sort of unusual in that it's more demonstrable, right? I mean, we're talking about ostensibly things that can be videotaped and, and verifiably seen. Part of the reason that many people believe in psychic abilities is they assume, uh, and this is something that Stephen King plays on in Carrie, that there is some underlying physiological basis for it, right? And so in, in King's case, in, in, in Carrie, we're told that there is a PKG, right? There's told there's there's some sort of genetic abnormality or mutation, what have you, that allows her to express this. And by the same token, you hear people talk about how, well, you know, some people have psychic ability because they, they use more than 10% of their brain, which is not true. Just, let's just debunk that now. <laughs> People use virtually all their brains, uh, just not at one time. Let's say the average person uses 10% of their brain. How much do you use? One and a half percent. The rest is clogged with malted hops and bong resin. So in the course uh, of a day or a week, you use pretty much all of your brains. At any given time, if you're watching reality TV, for example. Oh, no. You may be using only tiny, tiny, tiny amount. But it's not as if there's this there's this huge amount of the brain that lies fallow. That's just not how that works. But because that that belief is so common, people say, "Well, it makes sense, right? Like, why why is this person psychic and I'm not? Well, I'm only using 10 percent or 15 percent of my brain, and this person has somehow harnessed that untapped 90 percent, which isn't really true. That's one interesting thing that King does in Carrie is that he doesn't just say this magically happened. He gives a somewhat plausible uh, to many people, physiological basis for it. So you have uh, this triggering, the, this, um, this, the onset of menarche and, and menstruation, and she's going through changes. And of course, it's an awkward time for everybody, uh, not just Carrie. And it's something that we can all relate to. You know, we've all been the underdog. We've, we've all been bullied and picked on. Who hasn't wanted to be able to get back at the bullies. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think that's why Carrie has such staying power for all the reasons you mentioned. Stephen King uses telekinesis as, as a, such a strong metaphor for our bodies maturing and changing and, and how difficult it is to deal with those changes when we're growing up. So how do you sell skepticism and science to a world that well, like our world, that's not always welcoming to it. You have a lot of people that believe in conspiracy theories and fantastical ideas. They outright ignore proof when it's looking them right in the face. And your job usually is to debunk people's beliefs in that sort of thing. And how do you spin it as something positive and something that's not just, <laughs> I don't know, raining on everybody's parade? I mean, I'll be honest. Uh, skepticism can be a hard sell, right? Because oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, when you investigate popularly held beliefs, they don't turn out to be true. On the other hand, what's true matters, right? And so this is one of the tensions uh, between the, the public and, and sort of investigational skepticism is trying to say, okay, look, you know, I understand that, that beliefs can be comforting, but if those beliefs are false, they can also be harmful. And it depends a lot on what that belief is, right? So if somebody believes in Bigfoot or somebody believes that we didn't land on the moon, it doesn't matter that much. It's not gonna influence their life choices. It's not a big deal. But if a person believes in some unproven alternative medicine, that can literally kill them. I also see this, for example, in people who believe that they, they've been cursed or believe that there's a ghost in their house. What I try to do is I try to emphasize the practical side of skepticism. It's not negative, it's not, it's not mean-spirited. It's trying to get to the truth. And whatever the topic is, right, we're, we're surrounded by people all the time who wants to believe things. 
politicians, advertisers, friends, colleagues, whatever it is, get, trying to get us to buy into some proposal or some policy or do this or do that. And for all these things, we need to approach the topic using skepticism. And that just means asking for evidence. If you want me to believe what you're telling me, whatever the topic is, I don't care to, to buy your product, to vote for you, give me a reason. It's pretty simple, really. Yeah, I feel like reality and, and the world we live in is beautiful enough when viewed through the lens of science, and we don't need to explain things away with fantastical ideas. What's weird about what I do, and let's be honest, there's lots of weird things about what I do, but one of the weird things is that there's a sort of often unrecognized gap that skeptics fill. And that is sort of trying to, it's almost like con consumer advocacy. Because on one hand, you have the public who, let's face it, often believes crazy stuff that is, in some cases, harmful to their, their health, you know, coronavirus misinformation, anti-vax stuff over else. And on the other hand, you have, you have uh, working scientists who are often too busy to, to combat this misinformation. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. It's not that they don't know any better. It's that they're, they're busy doing research. They're busy trying to improve the world. And so there's this sort of gap that is sometimes still by journalists, but often not. And I see, I sort of see the skeptical point of view as sort of helping to bridge the two worlds, right? Bridge the worlds between the scientific side of things and the empirical side of things, and and the public who oftentimes is misled by misinformation and reality TV shows and things like that. So that's that's one of the roles that I see. I remember you saying something like that on an episode of your podcast where psychics, conspiracy theorists, they they can make all sorts of wild predictions and they're they're wrong most of the time. I mean, every once in a while they're right, you know, the broken clock right twice a day sort of thing. But because they're making so many bad predictions, so many wrong predictions, that there's nobody to really hold them account to that because by the time you try to debunk all of the false claims they're making, they're already off making making new ones. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. You know, people tend to re uh, remember the hits and forget the misses, right? So we remember the times when something amazing happened or they predicted something, but they forget the times when they predicted something and it was wrong or you know, or, or any number of other things, right? So there's, there's confirmation bias, there's psychological biases. It's just the, the way our, our brains work, right? It's not, it's not pathological. It doesn't mean people are stupid or crazy. It just means that we need a little help and nudging sometimes to, to find out what's real about the world. And the best way to do that is using science. The trope of adolescent girls with paranormal powers is pretty common in popular culture. And obviously Stephen King was at the forefront of that with Carrie. Why do you think that's such an attractive trope in popular culture? It's actually pretty common. Uh, you see this in new age circles. There's this notion that animals and children are more likely to see ghosts or experience psychic visions. And part of the idea is that they are somehow more open to the world, right? The idea is that, well, after a certain age, you're old and jaded and skeptical, and, you know, those mean old adults, you know, they, they but if you're, if you're dewy eyed and you see the world through a child's eyes, then of course, anything is possible. There's a sort of darker side to that, which is that if you look, for example, at the Puritans, one of the Puritan beliefs was that women are more likely to be possessed by the devil because they, it was believed that they, they are less moral. They don't have the fortitude to withstand the, the demonic attacks that, of course, manly men do. And so, the, you know, there was always this notion that telekinesis was centered around teens. And this actually goes back to the beginning of, of ghost investigation belief. You can look at the origin of, of ghost experiences per se uh, to date back to the, the mid uh, 1840s uh, and the rise of what's called spiritualism, which is it's not talked about much these days, but at the time it was this huge religion. And spiritualism was created by two teenage girls. It later turned out they hoaxed it, but they, they pretended to be uh, having ghostly communications through a series of knocks and raps, and they, they unwittingly launched a religion <laughs> of all things. So it, it really is literally true that the modern idea of what ghosts are and the, this idea of, of psychical communing uh, with, with the dead dates back to teenage girls pranking things. There's the Enfield Poltergeist case. In 1977, basically, it centered around a couple of teenage girls who claimed that they were having nightmares and bad things were happening to them. Oh, and by the way, there was a poltergeist. 
and things would fly through the air. Uh, again, sort of mimicking telekinesis. What was weird was that it would only happen when the girls were around. So it's not like everyone's like, oh, whoa, whoa something just flew across the air. It's like, no, when, when, when the girl was there, I think it was Janet, I think it was, she was 11 years old. When Janet's in the room, things fly around, Legos are flying. But when she's not there, they're not, right? Uh, there, was, there was another case in, um, in, uh, in the famous Columbia Poltergeist case in 1984, uh, a girl named Tina Resch, very similar situation where there was this alleged poltergeist that was centered around a teenage girl. And once again, uh, she claimed to be having visions and hearing things and things would fly across the room, again, mimicking telekinesis, but it would only happen <laughs> when she was there and when no one was watching her. And there's there's a famous photograph of her throwing a phone, pretending to be surprised. And the a photographer just happened to be happened to catch it. She's like, oh, what's going on here? It's like, you threw a phone. We saw you throwing a phone. Who throws a shoe? Honestly. So anyway, these and other cases, it's very similar to Carrie, right? Where you have a, a, a single teenage girl and there's mysterious phenomena that are happening only when she's around. And it's not surprising that you know, the King might borrow from that tradition. In one of the reprints of Carrie, in one of the editions, uh, Stephen King wrote actually wrote an introduction where he talks about the genesis of the idea of Carrie, of a telekinetic girl. And he references a story in Life magazine from forever ago where this paranormal phenomena would happen only when the girl was present. Sure. And I, I don't remember if he cites that specific instance that you did, but it does seem like a common enough thing where what seems to be paranormal activity is just <laughs> rambunctious kids. Yeah. It's a thing. And of course, the idea of supernatural phenomena happening and being centered around a teenage girl who may or may not be pranking. I mean, of course, in Carrie, she's not pranking. I mean, this, you know, she clearly does have these abilities. But if we're looking at the so-called real cases, there are several alleged, you know, poltergeist, paranormal activity, telekinesis cases. Unfortunately, in the real cases, they were almost certainly hoaxes. So there's that. Yeah, definitely not as entertaining. <laughs> not as entertaining, but still makes a fun story. From a folkloric perspective, is there something to children having these experiences because it's a reflection of adults being afraid of children, afraid of generational change? You know, like I'm thinking of the satanic panic of the 80s and the exorcist from the 70s. When you look and carry at the religious aspects of Carrie's mother, she explicitly links sex with sin, which is <laughs> certainly King did not invent that. That's a That goes way back, sex and sin. But we can also look historically, right? Because especially during among fundamentalists, they linked sex and sin and power. And this happened during the, the Salem witch trials, for example. This idea that the power came from young females sort of, you know, coming into their own. Uh, if you will, through menarche, through uh, menstruation, sort of becoming women, and in some cases trying to uh, assert their assert their power in a, in, a, in a patriarchal society. This is some of the places where, some, for example, some of the accusations of witchcraft came up. Is the uh, the idea that uh, these young girls they're beginning to assert their power, and oh, what what are they doing? Right? Are they are they communing with with Satan? You know, late at night on full moons and things like that. And so you have this this association with sex and sin and power all sort of coming together. And as in the Salem Witch Trials, as with Carrie's mom, oftentimes it was women who accused other women. So you have this, this these parallels here where there's this notion of trying to keep them in their place, right? Sort of try to try and keep Carrie a prepubescent girl, try and keep, you know, keep these girls from, uh, from demanding more liberties in the Puritan era, things like that. And so there's always going to be this, this tension between kids today and parents who are, in some cases, justifiably concerned about what our kids do. So that's another theme that may not be apparent at first reading of Carrie. Yeah, yeah. When you, when you think about it, Carrie is a sort of modern retelling of the witch trials. You have the accusers with the other students. You have burning at the stake with the prom literally burning down at the end. You can see why King drew on this. I mean, I, he'd be stupid not to. <laughs> it's all there. I mean, it's you can criticize Kara for not being one of his best. You could say, well, it's kind of a long way to go for basically a revenge story, but it's really well done. I mean, you, you can't deny it's, it's, you know, it's, it's very effective. It's creepy as hell. 
and again, you can see why it's, it's endured uh, this long. Well, Benjamin Radford, thanks for talking with me today on The Stephen Kingdom, and thank you for being a champion for science and skeptical thinking. The world needs more of it. There you go. Many thanks to Benjamin Radford for taking the time to chat with me. Don't forget to check out the Stephen Kingdom podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And if you'd like to throw in a few bucks to keep the Stephen Kingdom up and running, be sure to support our Patreon, where our patrons get access to all sorts of exclusive content, including extended and deleted scenes, early access to episodes, and your name in the end credits. Long days and pleasant nights, constant watchers.